I'd like to take a moment now and welcome you all to Human Trafficking in the Law, Looking Through a Wider Lens. Um, this is the fifth year we've had the honor of doing this event with the Florida State University College of Law. And I really want to thank the College of Law and everyone on the team there for supporting this program and supporting the work um, to end human trafficking throughout the whole year. I'd also like to thank many of our other sponsors who helped to distribute information about this event. Um, and uh, starting out, first of all, with legal services, of North Florida. Thank you for applying for the CLEs with us and working and planning this event. We'd like to thank the International Rescue Committee, the Big Bend Coalition Against Human Trafficking, Tallahassee Women Lawyers, the Government Bar Association, the Florida Government Bar Association, um, and two organizations at the FSU College of Law, the Advocates for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, or AIR, and the Trafficking in America Task Force. Um, again, both of those at the law school, we really appreciate everything that you do. Um, again, welcome everybody to our program. Um, as we're getting ready to start now, I'd like to um, remind you all also that this program is um, approved for 2.5 hours of continuing legal education credit. Um, and that credit will be announced and details on that will come at the end of our program. Again, my name is Robin Hassler Thompson. I'm a proud graduate of the FSU College of Law, class of 1984, um, and really happy to be with you all today. Um, I serve as the Executive Director of STAC, the Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center. And as you saw on the opening slides, Stack is in our area in the Big Bend um, of Florida in the six county area surrounding our capital city and Leon County. And what we do is we do programs like this to, to promote awareness and understanding of human trafficking, as well as to um, work to support individual survivors of trafficking and victims of trafficking. So our twin mission of working with um, anyone who is trafficked or at risk whether it's labor or sex trafficking, adults or children, uh, immigrants or non-immigrants, um, we're here to assist survivors. And we do this work in partnership with many, many people in our community. So thank you all. Um, you'll see at the bottom of this agenda slide, um, a mention of both the Big Bend Coalition Against Human Trafficking, which we encourage everyone who's on this training today to take a look at. If you have any questions about joining the Big Bend Coalition Against Human Trafficking, please send them to me. I'll put my name in the chat later and my email, I should say. Um, and also to the International Rescue Committee, our partner here uh, with whom we do this work in the Big Bend. So um, without any more um, from me, I'd like to take a moment and introduce Dean um, Aaron O'Hara O'Connor. Um, Dean O'Connor has been uh, incredibly welcoming and supportive of this work. Um, we're so grateful to you, Dean, for having us here again and for supporting this work, both um, by supporting local agencies like STAC and, and promoting education and awareness, and also for all the work that's done day to day at the law school. So let me introduce Dean O'Connor to open us up with a welcome. Thank you, Robin, and, and welcome everyone. Um, I am so proud um, of everything that STAC does and, and so proud that FSU alums play such a important leadership role in this organization. Uh, I've, I've said this before in welcomes, but I'll say it again. It wasn't until I came to FSU and met Robin and, and, and other alums who were working through STAC on human trafficking that I understood how big a problem human trafficking is in the United States. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed that I was ignorant for so long. Um, and I certainly was unaware of how big an issue it is here in the state of Florida. Um, and so I, I just cannot emphasize strongly enough how important this work is. And I'm particularly excited that Professor Anino has been working with the students on a, a special project um, designed to help with human trafficking um, and, and exploitation and raise awareness and understanding of the law, its strengths and its weaknesses in this area. And, um, and I'm, I'm thrilled and proud that they're um, presenting their work here today. Um, I know you've got a, a packed uh, uh, 
full of substance agenda here, so I don't want to take a lot of time, but I do want to welcome you all and, and just let you know if this is your first stack event, uh, it will not be your last. Uh, this is really um, compelling material and it, I think it really helps us all figure out what we can do to assist. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. And um, again, welcome everybody and welcome to everybody at FSU and all the alums of, of our law school, but also um, lawyers and others around the state. So thanks again for everything you do. We really, we really, we really appreciate it. Okay, so I would like to now start with um, letting you know what's going on for the next uh, about two hours of our day. Um, we're going to start with a program featuring Barbara Martinez. And let me introduce, I'll do a, an intro for Barbara. Barbara will speak for about an hour. Um, if you have any questions, and this goes for both when Barbara is presenting as well as when Professor Anino and the students are presenting, if you have questions that are foundational, like say there's an acronym that you didn't get and, and it starts to go pretty fast, please um, absolutely chat that question into the um, chat box. Um, we'll be myself and, and Vanya Yavera, I know you're here too. I'm sorry, Vanya Aguilar. <laughs> um, I know you're here too, Vanya. Um, Vanya and I um, will be monitoring the chat. And by the way, Vanya, thank you for everything you did to make this project um, happen today. Um, we are um, grateful to everything that you and Terry Coonan and the Center for the Advancement of Human Rights um, what, what you both do to make this um, program possible today, as well as to, um, to do this work throughout the year. So, um, so we'll be monitoring the chat. We're going to take all questions at the end um, from both Barbara and Professor Anino and the students. So hold your questions. We'll spend the last period of time doing that. So, um, so enough of that um, organizing stuff. And no too, you can put questions about any technical issues or other questions you have into the chat and um, Eddie will be there to answer them for you. So um, I'd like to start by introducing Barbara Martinez and let you all know that um, just to point to the longevity of this program, uh, four years ago when um, a woman named Martina Vandenberg came down and presented at this very event. <clears throat> she gave us an overview of all the cases in Florida that had been filed at the federal level. And one of the things that she noted and that we saw clearly was that the vast majority of anti-human trafficking cases in Florida came out of the Southern District of Florida. And more often than not, the prosecutor whose name was attached to those cases was Barbara Martinez. Um, Barbara Martinez now is a member of Holland and Knight's global compliance and investigation team in the firm's Miami office. Um, and there she focuses on um, in, internal corporate investigations, corporate compliance and training, and white collar criminal defense. But it's before that that we, be, we, came, we became uh, familiar with Barbara in her work um, when she was the chief of special prosecution section at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Florida and Miami. Um, there she tried human trafficking cases, supervised federal prosecutors who handled cases involving international and domestic human trafficking, money laundering, child exploitation, extortion, international kidnappings, and other transnational crimes. Ms. Martinez was also the human trafficking coordinator and the Project Safe Childhood Coordinator for the Southern District of Florida for over a decade. As the coordinator for these programs, she spearheaded coordination efforts between law enforcement, prosecutors, non-governmental organizations, and private industries to effectively prevent and identify human trafficking and child exploitation, as well as to investigate and prosecute these cases. Um, she teaches a trafficking seminar at the University of Miami School of Law. And I have to tell you her perspective as both having been a prosecutor and now in the civil world is invaluable for all of us to have. So, um, so I'll end my intro of you, Barbara. Thank you so much for all your time and for your work. And I'd like to um, invite you to begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I wanna um, say that, and, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Uh, that it's an honor to be here with everyone. And I think it's wonderful that FSU uh, is working 
so hard to do many new things to combat human trafficking together with STAC. Um, it is definitely a, a team effort. There's nothing that I have done in the arena of anti-trafficking work that I have done by myself. Uh, it, it has, it always uh, requires a village and, and frankly, in these types of prosecutions and cases, it, it was a pretty significant village of, of starting with federal prosecutors, law enforcement, but also many people, um, including uh, law students and individuals who have done so much great work to assist us. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, I'm so glad that, that everyone could join us here today and that you have an interest in this very important topic. Um, I will tell you that and I'm sorry, I'm trying to move my slides. Uh, I, I want to just share a little bit. Um, you've heard about my, my background, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about my experiences and, and the current role and how all of this, I think, really has impacted my view of anti-trafficking work. And I think it's relevant to, to today's presentation and, and to you. Um, so I began actually as a white collar prosecutor. So I did a lot of fraud cases um, at the Department of Justice uh, years ago in DC. And then I went to the US Attorney's Office. And, and although I did some major crimes, um, my focus initially was white collar. Um, the first trafficking case that I handled um, came reactively. There, uh, it was a brothel that had that what had been taken what they called taken down basically they had a raid um at an efficiency a very small apartment down in homestead which is an area <clears throat> that is um, a farming area for those of you who are not as familiar with with florida and <clears throat> excuse me they um had received information that there were uh individuals who were illegally in the country um, in, in the apartment next door and that there were there was probably prostitution going on. So at the time, and it, this was probably about, oh, I would say maybe 2006, um, there, there were often raids, immigration raids that were going down uh, in the farming area of Homestead. But this was, and, and people were being um, arrested and deported um, it, sometimes there were other violations, but but obviously um, back in 2005 and 2006, although the Trafficking Victim Protection Act was enacted in 2000, it was still a relatively new statute that was not as aggressively enforced at that time. But this particular raid was different because when law enforcement went in, they found a 14-year-old girl who had been prostituted um, and the clients for the traffickers were actually farm workers, tomato pickers down, um, you know, who were in that area. And they would ride their bikes or walk up and pay about $25 to have maybe 20 minutes with this 14 year old girl, um, uh, in addition to other adult females who were there. And at the time, you know, it was obviously seen as a, a, an egregious uh, child exploitation case. But as we worked the investigation and people were obviously arrested right away, and, and, but we, uh, we learned that it was not just the minor who had been exploited, um, but it was also the adult women who had been brought from Mexico were illegally in the country, but they came to the United States under the guise that they were going to have a wonderful life with their boyfriend. Um, instead, when they got to the United States, uh, the boyfriends or respective boyfriends, there were about four women um, that were found in that e efficiency. Um, and their respective boyfriends uh, then forced them to, uh, to engage in prostitution. And uh, they were told they were not, they didn't have a choice. That was the only way they could make money and they were physically abusive with these uh, women. 
we learned that these women and the 14 year old had been transported across county lines. They had, they had worked in uh, the Carolinas, they had worked in New York, and then they worked in um, not only South Florida, but other areas in Florida, including West Palm Beach. This obviously had a profound impact in how we approach uh, matters and how law enforcement at the time um, really started to look at prostitution cases. Um, it was really something here where you had to look beneath the surface in order to find the trafficking um, that had occurred. And over the years, um, I think about, and I have uh, had the privilege of meeting many survivors of trafficking and, and working with a great team of prosecutors and law enforcement uh, people and victim uh, folks uh, who, who help uh, so many survivors. And what, what keeps coming back is that, you know, by the time you prosecute a case, there's typically been so much exploitation and so much of a pattern of abuse that has gone on sometimes for years that it is um, incredibly uh, eye-opening and it, it, it it helps you to really focus on what can be done to, to try to prevent it. So I, I, I started like everyone else being somewhat ignorant about trafficking until it, I saw it firsthand and, and it was shocking. And then I uh, actively sought it and, and investigated it and prosecuted with great teams. And, and now um, I hope that to focus at least part of my practice in, in law um, to help companies and businesses to take some of the compliance and prevention action that they use uh, in other areas, um, which I'll talk about. To, and, and, and to do that when we're talking about anti-trafficking um, because it is such a significant problem, uh, not only in Florida and in the US, but globally. So with that perspective, um, I want to begin by uh, giving you a brief overview of human trafficking. Uh, it's, it's, we have a limited amount of time, so it's not meant to be um, a deep dive, but we will talk about some of the relevant statutes. I also want to uh, talk to you about um, some of the civil federal human trafficking laws and some of the trends that we have been seeing there. And then finally, federal regulation and compliance. Um, so for so many years, uh, basically I focused on the first two blocks. Um, then towards the end of my time at the US Attorney's Office, I added the civil uh, prong and, and now um, I've added the federal regulation and compliance. This is not to say, by the way, that there aren't other people who have been focused on this way before me. Um, absolutely there are. And certainly I, I know today you're gonna hear from students who already uh, have been thinking about compliance and regulation in, in a different way and chain of supply. But I think it's important to think about human trafficking in a holistic way. Um, and with that as a backdrop, let me tell you, um, Human trafficking in simple terms is the exploitation of another person for compelled service. Labor or commercial sex is, is the compelled service. And I like to begin with this very simple definition because I often find that, um, first of all, the statutory definitions for human trafficking are a little bit uh, cumbersome, they're long, uh, and, and people tend to have their own preconceived notions of what trafficking is. And so when you ask someone, what is human trafficking? You may get a description of sex trafficking um, or labor trafficking or involuntary servitude. But what they all have in common is that you're exploiting, exploiting someone else for labor. And, and, and I want you to think about that because you may be asking, well, is sex trafficking uh, really related to labor? Yes, it is. Uh, and, and that's the difference between so the difference between sex trafficking and, for example, uh, a sexual abuse, uh, a rape, let's say, of a minor, is that this is being done for the purpose of exploiting and, and you're exploiting through the labor. Um, so that uh, prostitution is seen as labor. Um, and, and I think if you understand the, the 
very important component of labor, even in sex trafficking, you will be much more easily able to distinguish between um, human trafficking and other, and other types of crimes, um, which can sometimes be an issue. <clears throat> so um, I think um, a lot of people know now, uh, but I still um, uh, run across people who don't know that that word, we have to make a, a distinction between uh, human trafficking and other types of um, immigration offenses, such as human smuggling. Human trafficking, again, we're focused on the exploitation, not the transportation. So for example, the the case that I told you about, and by the way, those cases were, were prosecuted and, and those defendants uh, did go to trial. Um, uh, I'm sorry, actually most of them pled out, but we, they were sentenced to 10 years or more. Um, it, but in that case, it, the, although we had victims, survivors, and even some traffickers who had violated immigration laws because they had come to the United States illegally and were here illegally, um, that that was obviously a human trafficking case for us. We did we were focused on the exploitation. Uh, none of the victims were were prosecuted, um, and and frankly, the Department of Justice uh, has a strict uh, policy that we do not prosecute victims um, of trafficking for minor offenses such as immigration um, offenses. So, so we're not looking, uh, we may add that charge, by the way, as, as a former prosecutor against the traffickers, uh, but we, would, uh, we were really focused on the exploitation and not the transportation. So it is the case that often uh, survivors or victims are coming to the United States knowing that they are coming illegally and that they're gonna be here illegally, but they have no idea what's gonna happen to them once they, once they get here. Um, and that, that they are uh, going to become victims of trafficking. So I won't spend too much time with this because I think that a lot of people know the differences uh, these days between smuggling and trafficking, but just know we're not talking about border offenses. You do not use those terms uh, interchangeably because uh, it can be very confusing. I remember doing a training once, um, uh, to, I went to uh, another country, I won't say which one, but, um, and, and I went to the hotel and it was a ballroom full of, you know, I think it was about 200 people. And when I walked up to the front desk, um, I said, I'm here for the, for the training. Can you tell me where it is? Oh, oh yes, the human smuggling training. And I said, oh my gosh, we, we have a lot of work to do. Um, so, uh, so human trafficking, believe it or not, and maybe if you have more experience in the traffic, human trafficking arena, you know this, but a question that comes up often is, is this human trafficking? Like, what is it? Um, it's not like a kidnapping where you see what's going on and you can easily identify it. And so, uh, you know, this is true for, for law enforcement officers. I would often have investigators um, or even prosecutors who would come in and ask, you know, is this human trafficking? I mean, it's it, it's it has some of the elements of it, but uh, but we're unclear. And and these are kind of the blocks that I used uh, then and, and frankly still now to figure out whether or not we have it. What is our vulnerability, meaning uh, for the victim or or the survivor? Why is this person being targeted? And and that's important, um, especially when you're when you're trying to build a case. And typically, obviously, it's going to be people, uh, or it can include people who are displaced, who uh, are poor, who may be uh, very isolated, who are from other countries, don't speak the language. Sure, all of that, all of those vulnerabilities come in. However, we have also seen many. Uh, for example, teenagers who come from good families who are not foster children, um, but maybe happen to get tied in with the wrong crowd um, or on, met someone online who, you know, was a boyfriend um, who was recruited by another friend at school uh, and, and told that this was a way to make money. Um, they're drug addicts. The people who we have seen who are adults who have that as a vulnerability. So 
so the importance of, of this prong is that it can be many different things. And so you have to kind of figure out, really get to the bottom without stereotyping, really get to the bottom of, in this particular case, uh, understanding this survivor, um, what, what is our vulnerability here? Uh, I, I once had a case where we were working, <laughs> I remember Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, um, their Human Trafficking Task Force came and said, we have a matter we wanna present to you, uh, but there's just one problem. The trafficker is in Mexico. They're traffickers, there were two of them, and has been for a while, for some months. And I said, well, I'm not sure how we're gonna prove that they're trafficking now. And turns out, uh, and they did a great job of showing a lot of transfers going to Mexico um, on, on basically uh, by pretty much every, every week, uh, there was a tons of money going from these two adult women to Mexico. So the vulnerability was that the children uh, these two women had two children, each had one uh, in Mexico and the traffickers had the children there and they used them as leverage. And they said, you will never see these children again if you don't continue to send us the money. Now that's not a typical situation that we had seen. And so it was really getting to the bottom of that particular one to figure that out. Exploitation, of course, uh, which can take up many different forms, uh, whether it's, it's physical abuse, mental abuse, um, just uh, we've seen people who have been given drugs. We've seen people who were um, constantly, constantly berated, not allowed to eat, not allowed to sleep, different, different ways to exploit people um, and sometimes a combination. And then of course, labor or, or commercial sex, which we discussed already. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Trafficking Victim Protection Act um, was enacted in 2000. And I think because it is such a broad um, stat or a broad set of laws, it, it, and, and there's so much that goes into making a trafficking criminal prosecution, um, it really took a long time to start to see federal prosecutions. And, and then only after federal prosecutions did you see state prosecutions. The Florida law or anti-trafficking statute was significantly modified in 2014. And it was, I believe it was 2014, uh, but certainly prior to that, there were no uh, state prosecutions that were happening um, in the state of Florida using that statute. Now, the, the state uh, anti-trafficking statute. There were, and, and there was good reason for it. There were a lot of problems with that statute. So they, the um, uh, legislation that was ultimately uh, changed or, or brought forth and um, passed into law was more like the federal statute, which made it much easier and better for prosecutors. Um, and also obviously included additional funding and training and things for, for state prosecutors. But with that in mind, um, you know, we've seen this, the statutes change significantly. Uh, this is the sex trafficking statute. Um, the only things I want to focus on here is just that unlike other crimes, um, and this is really important, and I, and I say this to potential uh, clients and clients now, uh, it, it, this is not a, a just a knowing standard. Um, it's a knowing or in reckless disregard standard. And if it's a minor, if you're engaged in prostitution of a minor for um, uh, for money, uh, you know, or it, the exchange of anything of value, then you are violating the statute. Period. Uh, there's no uh, knowledge knowing requirement. Um, it can be, so we really have three options um, in, in knowing reckless disregard or you're engaged in the sex trafficking of a minor, which that piece is, is not on this particular slide. But um, that means that there's a lot more potential for criminal liability um, and that it's much easier for the prosecutors, whether state or federal to, to well, this is the federal statute, but um, uh, the state statutes often have similar language that makes it easier um, 
to prosecute than other types of crimes. Um, for uh, forced labor, knowingly providing or obtaining labor uh, or services of a, of a person through these four means down in the, at the bottom. The thing that I really wanna highlight for you here is that um, I think that most people, when you're thinking about both sex trafficking and labor trafficking, think of really bad physical abuse, beatings, chains, um, and, and, and frankly, that's just not the, the norm uh, um, in cases that we see, especially cases involving US citizens or minors, uh, domestic uh, type cases. Because frankly, you can manipulate, you can use fraud, you can lie, um, and you can do other things that make it so that you're not putting yourself out on the, uh, on the radar as much. Um, and, and traffickers have, uh, that I've seen are very good at, at manipulation and, and at fraud. So here you see the coercive scheme, a block is highlighted. And the reason it's highlighted is because that is what we see more often than not. By the way, abuse of the process is if, um, if it can be telling someone that they must, they're, they're, you're compelling them to work uh, because you're telling them that they must do so or you're gonna report them to the police if they're illegally in the country or committing some other, some other violation. Or it could also be you're threatening to sue their family civilly um, in certain countries throughout the world. You know, having debt is a very, very serious and problematic issue, and people will do anything to avoid it. So, so that is um, uh, the abuse of process. If we know that a trafficker is using uh, the legal system as leverage and threatening to bring some sort of action, uh, it may still be labor trafficking. But courts are course of scheme is what we see the most of. Um, and then of course, if you're uh, recruiting, harboring, transporting, or, uh, you know, again, providing, obtaining a, an individual for forced labor, then you have the labor trafficking. So these are, and, and we, we will have the slides available for you. I'm sorry, I don't have as much time to, to really break it down, but I think it gives you a good idea. And as for the course of schemes, which again, you see in both uh, human traffic, I mean, sex trafficking and labor trafficking matters. These are the types of things that you will see, you know, and just to pick a few, uh, physical isolation, false promises, uh, debt manipulation, basically hanging debt over people's uh, heads. We, we had, uh, we saw many cases involving that. Um, and I'll give you an example in a second, but typically you're gonna see a combination of these things. And, and so what should stand out to you is that in order really to get to the bottom of this and to figure out what's happening in, in a particular situation, you really have to look beneath the surface. You really have to have somebody tell you, and most survivors of trafficking are, don't consider themselves victims don't know what human trafficking is, is even now. Um, and so they don't always recognize the significance of everything here. And I'll give you an example. Um, so both the staffing service owners uh, were, who were from the, the Philippines were employing laborers uh, and there were actually, I believe it was 39 Filipino workers that they had recruited and had living in a home, by the way, um, that uh, were all sleeping, you know, that everyone was sleeping in this kind of cookie cutter uh, development. Um, and they would go and work at restaurants. Uh, they were working also at the country clubs uh, in, in all of South Florida. And it, it turned out that um, these individuals were really being forced through a course of scheme to uh, do the labor. And when, when law enforcement, and I did not personally, by the way, did not work on this case. This was worked on by prosecutors in West Palm Beach. Uh, but I, I remember uh, one of the investigators telling me how when they interviewed many of the survivors in this matter, they really, did not recognize until months later how, 
how one, they were being defrauded. They were told they were gonna get things that they didn't get. Um, they were not allowed to leave and go out on their own or seek medical attention when a couple of individuals needed it. Um, they were not allowed to cook what they wanted to cook uh, because the, uh, the, the trafficker, the lead trafficker who was a woman didn't want it. They liked to eat fish and she didn't like the smell of it. Um, they were uh, told that they had to pay for how everything, everything that they did in that house, there was a, a long bill for. So they were not being paid what they were told. They had a huge debt to keep them there. Um, and, and they were very aggressive and abusive in, in, in speaking to them. Incidentally, 39 Filipino workers were living in one residence and it never was reported until, the, I mean, months later. And it just seems at the time, I remember thinking it was so odd that the neighbors would not think that this was unusual. But again, it was because it was not a beating. These individuals were going to work in the mornings in a van. They were being transported back. They were allowed to go to church. By the way, most traffickers that I've encountered do make that exception. They're not allowed to go anywhere else most of the time, uh, but they will allow them to go to, to, to church, um, which is interesting. Um, so, uh, so this was the situation where it, you really had to get a lot of information in order to figure out that we had a forced labor case, prosecutors did charge this, and this was a case um, that ended up in a plea. Um, so this is U.S. versus Boston, uh, a little different type of case, and, and I, I raise it now, and we're going to talk about it at the end again, um, but this was a sex trafficking case where we were looking at victims who were, or potential victims who were adults. So again, much harder uh, looking at a coercive scheme, ultimately, but initially what we had was an individual, Mr. Bastone, uh, who was in the United States under a false uh, visa and identity. He had actually been deported. Um, he was a, a Jamaican citizen and um, came back under a, a different uh, and stolen identity. And he, uh, we had a report from a woman in Australia that uh, Bastone, of course, was living in South Florida. Um, and we had a report from a woman in Australia, that, uh, actually a family member of hers initially, that she was a victim of, of trafficking, that Boston had come to Australia and taken her uh, away as her boyfriend and eventually was abusive with her and forced her to prostitute. So we worked uh, to investigate this matter, had a great team of law enforcement and prosecutors on it. And I personally did not prosecute this case. I supervised it. Uh, it was Olivia Che and Roy Altman, who's now a federal district judge. And um, they did a phenomenal job and, and were able to discover that there were a number of other women who were physically beaten uh, and forced to prostitute ultimately. But it would initially start as a coercive scheme in that um, he would be the boyfriend. Uh, he lied about who he was. He, uh, uh, for example, the Australian victim, he told her that they could open up. She was a manager at a restaurant, very attractive woman with a, a good family. Um, he pretended to be somebody else, told her they could move away, come to the United States, uh, open up their own restaurant and uh, do a business. He pretended to, have, and he did have a lot of money, but it, he pretended that it was a lot more than, than what he did. And what he did have was, be, was from trafficking earnings uh, because he already had other women who were working for him and traveling for him and engaging in prostitution. So once he took her away, um, she began to work. He convinced her to, to start working but then she wanted to stop. So you have this kind of unusual, um, I say unusual in that, you know, a lot of times people think you, you have to be forced into it, but trafficking can also be that um, you're, you are engaged in prostitution and then you wanna get out of it and you're not allowed to stop. 
Uh, and at that point, he became very abusive. Uh, and at trial, she testified that one day um, she had uh, said she didn't want to work, that she was sick, and he took her uh, and drove her out to a park somewhere and told her that, uh, had her sit on a folding chair, uh, he had a, a gun and he told, put it to her head and told her that he could kill her and no one would ever know. So it was something that had escalated and, and that was obviously what he was absolutely capable of, but he was in, incredibly manipulative and was engaged in a lot of fraud and a lot of money laundering and had her open up bank accounts, had her doing a lot of the supervising ultimately of the other uh, women in order to shield himself. Um, and so, so this was a case where for some of the women, coercive scheme was the theory for this victim who he was, he didn't beat everyone and most traffickers treat every victim differently uh, in my experience. But for, for obviously for the Australian victim, he, it was a physical abuse type of situation. So I've mentioned some of the other statutes that come up here. Um, and, you know, it's not just, it's not just trafficking. I, I always tell people that human traffic, uh, having done white collar work, human trafficking is some of the more complex type of work that I've ever um, engaged in. And, and it's because it's difficult to put all the pieces together. It does involve typically a lot of fraud, but it also has a lot of overlap with other violations. These are just uh, other provisions of the TVPA, um, such as uh, it has its own obstruction provision, uh, unlawful conduct with respect to immigration documents if you're giving uh, individual false documents or withholding their immigration documents, such as passports, um, that can be a violation of its own. But you also see money laundering uh, and you see immigration offenses, you see fraud in foreign labor contracting. For example, in the case involving um, the Filipino workers uh, and, and the couple who, who brought all of those workers in, um, they were not ultimately charged with this provision, but they're, they're, this is a viable provision if you are defrauding individuals in enticing them to come into the United States for, for employment. Um, and of course, there are other fraud charges, uh, not to mention many other types of uh, offenses. I tried a case involving uh, traffickers who were distributing Xanax to their victims in order to get them to, um, to engage in sexual acts. Um, so that obviously had a drug component, but there are, there's a lot of overlap. And so having a, 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 a holistic view of what's occurring and, and listening to, to the survivors and to the evidence is, is really critically important because the schemes may differ. We have about 15 minutes, Barbara. Okay, thank you. So. So in, in 15 minutes, let me just say that I've spent a lot of time talking about examples and, and um, where you are when you're working with offenses that are so challenging is you really have to rely on partnerships, as I mentioned earlier. Um, these are some of the individuals um, that work on not just, this is says anti-laboring, but it's also um, uh, sex trafficking. It is a group of law enforcement um, and investigators, but also very, very important to have financial institutions, community members, medical professionals, um, of course, non-governmental organizations, uh, individuals who can help in many different respects. Um, so uh, every district in the country has a, a a task force, a federal task force that includes uh, state and local members. In South Florida, if, for example, if we had members of every, across every sector, and we really rely on individuals uh, to help. And the reason is because this is, as I said, a complex crime, it's difficult to identify. So you really need to have people like medical professionals to highlight, uh, we have a concern or we, or, or, people who are doing inspections for businesses, 
we've seen a pattern of uh, massage parlors, for example, for a few months of the radar screen because in South Florida because of some of what um, the local inspectors were seeing. So all of these um, challenges mean that we have to rely on other people to help us. Now, uh, as far as cases prosecuted, um, th these are the numbers for, for 2018. Um, not as high as you would expect. This certainly is not reflective of the, the huge problem that there is. Um, but I think that what you can see is, or what you could take away from this, is that it's very challenging. And one, to identify it, uh, two, to be able to develop the case. Um, and, and that leads to uh, not, uh, not, not any um, results or number of prosecutions that truly reflect uh, the problem. So we must focus then also on federal civil laws. Uh, again, the TVPA has a civil component that has been modified uh, on, on several occasions. And this is um, uh, the statute. I don't have time to go into it in detail, but I do want to share with you that there has been an increase in civil litigation. In other words, victims or survivors of trafficking are filing civil claims against their traffickers. Um, and the, the reason for that is, let's say um, that there is insufficient evidence for trafficking or that they can perhaps uh, seek some restitution, uh, but get some of the money back, um, they may choose to file civil claims instead. These are some of your key players here, in addition to civil attorneys, having other types of attorneys who help uh, survivors to do this. Um, again, limitations to civil causes of action, uh, you know, are, the, are really I, I would say this, the same, but also the, the process of civil litigation is much longer typically and requires a lot more uh, uh, resources actually because um, that you don't typically have. So, so it's maybe even more challenging sometimes than the criminal. Um, so that takes us to, to really where we are now and what I hope that, that you will um, really understand if holistically when you're looking at trafficking, if every if it's so challenging, um, and obviously every effort to to bring uh, traffickers to justice and to rescue survivors is worth every second uh, that you spend on it. But you want to really try to help prevent trafficking where you can, whether it's of minors, adults, sex, or labor. And that's where federal regulation um, and compliance comes in. This is just a quick, um, you know, it's actually a diagram and I, I have to share with you. Someone, I presented with someone who used this for one of their cases. I modified it very slightly uh, and was able to make this fit the Bustone case. So what's the point of me telling you that? It's that Almost every trafficking scheme, even if we're talking about sex trafficking of minors, um, which by the way, was the bulk of the work that we prosecuted in Florida uh, as federal prosecutors involving minors uh, who are US citizens. You will typically see, and especially in cases involving adults, uh, the trafficker engaged in lots of transactions and coming across here uh, the bus in the Boston case, he, he was paying for high-end hotels actually for some of the girls. He was flying and traveling with some of the women. Sometimes the women were flying and traveling on their own. He had his own home, but he also had a house where he kept some of the women. His favored women would live with him. Uh, he had multiple bank accounts uh, and, and actually had more than just two or three bank accounts. And, and women would make deposits and withdrawals from different locations and uh, usually different states. So what, what you're seeing here is trafficking happening that is really hitting on a lot of different industries and people, especially the banking industry. So absolutely, I guess the point is 
if people are aware and know what trafficking is and understand how their industry is impacted, they may be able to detect it, report it, and ultimately prevent it. Um, so U.S. businesses, uh, you know, are currently under certain obligations, certain types of business, businesses, I should say. There are executive orders out there relating to federal contracts, um, you know, employers who are contracting foreign workers uh, uh, must do certain things to comply with anti-trafficking and, and this lays that out um, efforts uh, and trying to, to detect it. But again, it's an executive order and the, um, the enforcement, uh, I'm, I'm thinking we may begin to see more enforcement. And why do I say that? because the immigration laws are about to change with the new administration, which means more potential foreign workers and also more um, need to regulate that. So you may, uh, that may have an impact. Um, and these are some of the obligations now uh, that you have uh, imposed by the executive order. I don't think those will necessarily change, but I think the enforcement piece might. And that is that you're basically telling um, government contractors who are hiring foreign workers that you have to do certain things to make sure that you're checking for trafficking. Um, recruitment fees is always uh, an issue to look out for with that. Um, so what are the possible consequences of non-compliance with an executive order? It's a civil sanction or criminal actions for false statements uh, or allegations of the Civil False Claims Act, which are not that significant, frankly, in the big scheme of things. That said, there is other liability as well, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so chain of supply, I know we have a presentation on that, so I won't spend too much time uh, other than to say that California has this act um, where certain businesses who make a certain amount of profit um, should be transparent about, or their really transparency requirements about their chain of supply um, and their efforts to weed out uh, labor that is infected by trafficking. Um, Interestingly, uh, Kamala Harris, now vice president, um, was very active in anti-trafficking uh, efforts in, in California at a certain point. So it'll just be interesting to see uh, if that changes anything with regard to policies going forward. Um, but, you know, they, they sort of lead the country, California, in, in, in providing some sort of transparency, transparency and supply uh, chain uh, regulation. But again, where is, where is the enforcement? And uh, let's see if we see any changes on, on that um, or any, any uh, interest in, in applying this to other states. There are other states who have done some work, I should point out. Uh, but again, it's, it's really at, at, at preliminary stages. And then you have other countries that do have uh, similar transparency and supply chain uh, laws that, that are, are more models. Um, again, something to look forward to in, in expanding. So those are re regulations um, you know, that, that are meant or laws that are meant to kind of address transparency and um, due diligence, essentially, you know, making sure that you're following up on some of these immigration requirements and some of the things that are mandated by executive order. But can a business and a corporate uh, official be found criminally liable? Absolutely. And I, and I want to just share with you um, that in some of the compliance work that, that I do, I see how um, folks often uh, call for a compliance program after a problem has happened, right? Um, isn't that always the case? Uh, and, and so once something's highlighted, you want to address it. The problem with doing that in the trafficking arena is that we have this reckless disregard standard that I've indicated that is unique and different from other white collar offenses where you're talking about just unknowingly or unknowingly and willfully 
if you have, if you are a business and you have a trafficking problem that blows up, let's say you find workers uh, who have been exploited, not only is it a, obviously horrific for, for those people who are exploited, bad for business, uh, you know, for, for, right? I mean, this is not a PR, uh, uh, you know, great thing to have happen. And add to that, that now you have this reckless standard where people will be looking to see whether or not you have done anything to try to prevent it, detect it. Uh, has anybody complained about anything? Is there a reason you should have known about this? Um, that's very, very important to know about trafficking and about businesses and their um, their potential liability. So, you know, if you're benefiting financially under the statute, if you're in, involved in a venture, which is defined just as two or more individuals, uh, you know, who are associated and you're benefiting financially, you may have criminal liability, certainly civil liability. So what... What does that mean? Um, it means that we have seen hotel chains that have been sued civilly. Um, not, um, I have seen a criminal uh, prosecution of an owner in a uh, of an owner of a small mom and pop motel, um, but that was a very extreme. I mean, there were a lot of minors that were coming out of that motel. Uh, it was not a chain. Um, it is a, a more difficult standard criminally. But if you're thinking about banks, uh, if you're thinking about, think about that chart, I just showed you all the, the things that you come across and, and, and what are people doing? Um, are they seeing a pattern? Should they be seeing a pattern? It really helps to, to open your eyes and to help you see that corporate compliance is super important. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, in the white collar arena, to detect fraud, it happens all the time. There is a huge uh, focus on making sure, and, and there's good uh, reason for it. Um, there are sentencing guidelines that, that tell you if you are a corporate entity or a business that's involved in trying to, to prevent white collar offenses, we're gonna give you credit. We're gonna help you to consider that in, in when you get into trouble, whether it's civil or criminal. So that is well known in the white collar arena and i want to highlight it to you as as and to others and i try to highlight it to businesses and corporations as well that you know corporate compliance should be including chain of supply as well as other anti-trafficking efforts understand that that businesses have liability um, it's not just about doing the right thing, which most people, I find most businesses do want to do the right thing. They absolutely want to help um, and, and fight this cause. But they should also know that it, it also comes with not helping also comes with liability and not having a corporate compliance program that really educates people, trains people, uh, instills or sets forth policies that individuals are to follow, and also getting legal advice when they need it um, is, is very important and may not only help, and I've just kind of gone through what the benefits are, not only helps the business, uh, so, so it's a good business decision, but it could literally save a life. It could prevent people from heinous exploitation. So, you know, in all of these things, remember that the potential impact of anti-trafficking efforts um, is only significant in my view, and, and I say this from a broad, I'm talking about overall, how do we prevent this? If you do it as, as, as a coordinated effort um, and you include prosecutions, civil actions, communities, and the private sector. Human trafficking is a complex crime. It, it, it takes a village, it means that everyone has to come together and work together and find ways to really make an impact. Every individual, and I used to say this all the time, who is um, saved or rescued or who is set free uh, and becomes a survivor is worth all of that effort. Um, but in order to really, I think, have long-term, uh, I guess, success, 
uh, in anti-trafficking efforts, prevention and, and compliance are a big, big part of that. So uh, what's next? Uh, it's great, actually, it, I think it flows really well to know that we're gonna hear from some students about uh, their project and what they're doing on chain of supply because, you know, I, I, I wanna leave you, I guess, with what I used to tell prosecutors that I supervised and worked on teams. You know, oftentimes people, after they've worked on a few cases, think that they're an expert. I am a, uh, an expert at almost nothing. And if there's anything I've learned, it's that. And, and so it's so important to, in your anti-trafficking efforts, to always remain open-minded, to listen, listen well, and uh, to come up with ideas that are different um, and new and, and to know that you don't know everything. Because if you completely stereotype and try to come up with a one size fits all, it will, it will inevitably um, cause you to make a huge mistake and to potentially miss the opportunity to help somebody. Um, so anyway, uh, it, I hope that this was helpful for you. And um, we, we, I understand that the PowerPoint will be available to you. Barbara, thank you so much. I feel like we should do little clap. I know there's little <laughs> clap icons we can put up there. That was a great deal of information. That last slide with the circles, that's my favorite because it really exemplifies what we're trying to do here at Stack to really engage the entire community in this effort to end human trafficking, to prevent it, and then to understand really how difficult it is to meet those high criminal standards and there's so many other things we can be doing. So thank, thank you so you. much, that, that was great. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do now is turn to part two of our program and introduce Professor Paolo Anino. Um, uh, Professor Anino is the director of the FSU College of Law Public Interest Law Center and founder of the Human Trafficking Exploitation Law Project. Um, he advocates against forced child labor and the supply chain of everyday goods and foods in the United States. He earned his PhD from Fordham and a JD from FSU. And I have to tell you, that's when I got to meet Paula when I was a law student. And he was, I think, a year or so ahead of me. And um, just so all of your students know, and, and I, I want to introduce and just mention their names, Julie Marble, Gigi Green, Melody um, Andrews, and uh, Summer Meenan. Um, when I was about your age, that's when I got to meet Paolo and look at, um, we've, we're still working together. So how lucky am I? Um, Paolo, thank you for everything that you've done, um, both in this field and in so many other areas of helping um, people, uh, particularly children in your advocacy and work at FSU. And, um, and let me thank you very much for um, also collaborating with Stack. One of the things that we know we we can do is rely on, on you to work together, as Barbara said, that it does take a village. So, um, so we do enjoy that collaboration. So um, may I turn it over to you now to introduce your students and begin part two of our program. Uh, reminding everybody that we will have questions at the end of both Barbara and Paulo and his team, and we'll also give you that CLE information toward the end of the program. Well, thank you, Robin. Uh, first, I want to say uh, for those out there who are listening, uh, Robin Thompson is one of the leaders in the state of Florida and has been educating uh, us in Florida uh, about human trafficking and her work in education and changing culture. Uh, law follows culture. And, and she is doing that heavy work in, in doing presentations around. Uh, our state of Florida to change our culture, to understand human trafficking. And then I wanna make a comment real quickly on, on uh, attorney Barbara Martinez. Uh, that was an excellent presentation, understanding the law and, uh, and her great work that she has done as a prosecutor and is now doing in, in the work of compliance. And, and I agree 100% uh, that uh, that is the issue, uh, the, the compliance issue that we really, really need to work on uh, in United States and in Europe. Uh, so I want to st stress that. Um, I just want to make two, two, maybe three quick comments. 
One is, and the reason why I'm here today, otherwise I'll just leave it all to my students. Uh, the reason I'm here today is uh, this is a momentous year. Yes, not just because of yesterday, right? We had a momentous inauguration. But in addition to that, it's a momentous year uh, because the United Nations uh, has declared uh, that 2021, that's where we are, 2021, although last year just evaporated with the pandemic, but we're in a new year, 2021 is the year, uh, international year for the elimination of child labor. So it's the, the, the 2021 is the, has been declared the international year for the elimination of child labor. Now, um, when we talk about child labor, and I'll be really brief on this, um, we're talking approximately of 152 million children around the world who engage in child labor, 152 million. Uh, in the cyber world out there, uh, does anyone know, uh, and, and you could chat real quickly on this, uh, does anybody know that what the population of Florida is? Someone, can someone chat that answer? I know someone must have. There must be some Floridians out there who know what the population is. I'm not seeing it yet. Let me see. No responses yet. Okay. Well, we'll <laughs> right. Very. Oh, 21 million. There you yeah, go. Very, very close. It's 22.2 million uh, uh, citizens in Florida. 22.2 million. Uh, so what we're talking about then, when we talk about child labor, we're talking appro approximately uh, seven Floridas. Seven Floridas are filled with children um, who are participating in child labor. Half of the 152 million children are under the age of 12. Half are under, under the age of 12. So uh, that's the, the main thing I wanna get across that this is a, a great moment uh, in January to bring up the declaration, uh, the international declaration to eliminate child labor. Uh, I do want to introduce real briefly my students this uh, start with uh, Julie Marble. Julie is a third year law student. Uh, she is a, she's an amazing law student and I expect to see her in Congress uh, um, for her leadership. Uh, she is passionate about uh, human trafficking and she learned that for, through her work through the Guardian Ad Litem program. And the Guardian Ad Litem program advocates for children around the state. Uh, the other student I wanna mention is uh, uh, Gigi Green. Uh, Gigi is, when we see this video and when we're also seeing the PowerPoint, I need to give Gigi Green a lot of credit for all that, for her in, imagination and her creativity. She, but expect it. She's a graduate from, from, from Smith College uh, with a degree in English, uh, language and literature. Uh, and she is also passionate about human trafficking. And she learned that through the Children's Advocacy Clinic. Uh, the other student I want to mention is Melody Gr Andrews. Uh, Melody is Melody's not a, th a third year law student. She's a second year law student and she's jumped into this uh, in the last uh, uh, few weeks. And uh, she has her bachelor's degree from FSU, right there, FSU, in theater and creative writing. And uh, she is also passionate about uh, human trafficking. And she learned that through the Chose Absey Clinic. And one of my stellar students, they're all stellar here, is Summer Meehan and Summer, third year law student, uh, originally from Louisiana. Uh, she did work in, um, uh, she has her undergraduate degree from Texas Christian University. Uh, she has studied abroad in India doing human trafficking work in India and has really been a major influence. And she's also, although she's so modest about this, uh, we're doing a statewide um, podcast on human trafficking, and she has been a leader on that podcast, which we hope to uh, publish uh, shortly. So uh, with, that, with that note, again, 2021, the main takeaway is 2021 is the international year to eliminate child labor, and let, uh, I'll let Gigi uh, go from there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we're going to start by showing you a video that we did last semester um, in the health clinic. I think some of you may have seen it already, but here it is. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Julie, and we are students at Florida State University College of Law in the Human Trafficking Exploitation Law Project, working to end child labor practices in the cocoa industry. Children are our future, and it's important that each and every child is protected. During Halloween, we all love seeing the smiling faces and hearing the happy chatter of children as they eagerly watch candy bars plop into their bags. But before buying and handing out candy this Halloween season, Please keep in mind where that cocoa for the chocolate bar originated from. Children, primarily between the ages of 5 and 11, are being forced to wield dangerous tools like this one. Accidents are frequent and uh -oh. sometimes even lives are lost to child labor. Imagine a 7-year-old being forced to wield this machete to harvest the cocoa that... Uh -oh. Let me try it again. Hold on, it keeps freezing. Hold on, it just froze. Give me one second, sorry. This is how technology is. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know if Eddie or the team at FSU could. Um, do you want to uh, try I it again? Try, I could try showing it um, uh, from from my computer if that helps. Uh, but uh, maybe it's worth trying again on, yeah, on little, Gigi's computer. Yeah, let me see. Can you still see my screen? Yes. 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 Let's try again. It needs to be on PowerPoint presentation mode in order for you to show it. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. This is, this is technology. Ready to harvest the cocoa that makes treats just for us. Sadly, he and his counterparts will likely never taste the end product. Remember, safety, happiness, and the overall well-being of children everywhere should be prioritized. And as of now, not many companies are committed to eradicating this form of child labor. It's time for us to speak up. Do you have a, is there a website URL that has the video? We could always put that in the chat. Um, yeah, I'll look it up, but maybe we can go ahead. Um, we can show the video a little bit later, but maybe we can go ahead with the rest of the presentation. Hopefully that works fine. Um, but yes, we'll find them. Okay. Well, I'll start. Um, the, what the video was trying to show you, um, what well, was trying to make a point in just delving into the cocoa industry and how children are abused in this industry. Um, they're trafficked in this industry and I'll explain a little bit later. Oh no, did I freeze? Okay. No, I did. I've frozen on mine, sorry. Um, I'll explain a little bit later about how they get into these, um, get into these situations and what happens. But I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the cocoa industry. Um, as you know, chocolate is a huge part of American culture. We use chocolate to celebrate and punctuate nearly every holiday. Um, like in the video, it showed Halloween. Um, we use it, Valentine's Day is coming up. And we use chocolate for birthday cakes and anniversaries and whatnot. So on average, um, Americans consume about 2.8 billion pounds of chocolate a year. And that averages to about 11 pounds of chocolate per person. And the, ch the chocolate industry is worth a whopping $130.56 billion. And um, Julie will, will explain later um, about how that money is being used and what it could be used for. Um, and 
the cocoa industry is expected to rise between 20 and 2020 and 2027, about 4.6%. So there's gonna be a lot more revenue coming in. Um, I also wanted to talk about the origins of the chocolate, the cocoa. Um, Ghana and the Ivory Coast are responsible for about 20%, I mean 70%, of the raw cocoa that big companies use like Nestle's and Hershey's and Mars, they use in their products. And approximately 90% of the farmers rely on the cocoa as their primary source of income. So it's a very big um, market in these countries. Lots of people rely on it um, to just live day to day. Um, and the way cocoa is grown, as you can see here, they're grown in little pods, like the cocoa fruit or the pods, they grow on trees. Um, and then the pods are chopped, and I'll show you in a little bit, hopefully the video works, but the pods are chopped a certain way um, in order to get the cocoa from inside of it, um, inside of the fruit. And the cocoa beans are what's used to make the chocolate because they're roasted and, and um, used later on in production. So I just kind of wanted to show you um, how the process works, how the cocoa is gathered. Um, hopefully this works. Um, but I just wanted you to see how dangerous this is. And there you go. Days. Now the harvesters make this look really quite simple, but it's very important that you cut the pod correctly. You actually have to cut the pod as close to the pod as you can to leave what we call the cushion. If you cut the cushion off, you lose in the possibility. Okay, that's the first part of the video. Days. Now the and then this is the second part. So this the first part was showing you um, how precise you have to be with the machete to cut and get the cocoa. It has to be done a certain way or else you risk ruining the project on um, the product. Here's the second way. This is another video showing like in more detail how they extract the pods. And I just want you to keep in mind that, you know, children are the ones holding these machetes. So um, the woman doesn't even hold a machete because she's worried, but let's see. Now we're at the stage where I actually cut the pods open. As I'm a novice, I only get a stick. I don't actually get one of the big knives, which is a bit disappointing, but probably a little bit safer. So normally they're cut with a knife and the pod is cracked open. And as you can see, it's really quite thick, but I'm going to attempt it with a stick. Okay, so she didn't even want to use the machete yet. You know, we're expecting children as young as five to use that machete and you know, cut the pods to extract this. This is clearly something adults need to do, not children who don't really understand, you know, how to use those tools and they're so little. Um, and so one of the dangers like you just saw was the machete. Kids face um, a lot of, they face injury and even death because as you can see, it's easy to slip and cut yourself. They can lose limbs, um, get infections and whatnot because of this, you know, their lives are in danger. And if they lose a lot of blood or anything, they don't really have the ability to just go to a hospital and just go get care. Um, they're also exposed to a lot of toxic pesticides, which will have a lot of um, long lasting health issues that they're, because they're breathing in all of that toxicity, it's gonna cause problems in at least some children. Um, a lot of these children face corporal punishment. If they try to run away, they get hurt. Um, they'll get hurt if the person who's in charge catches them or if they refuse to work, they face that. So not only are they in danger while working, if they try to stop, they also face being um, endangered. And another thing is these children also lack education or lack access to education because if they're constantly working and they're here on this farm for hours and hours, they don't have time to go to school. And even if they do go to school, they aren't... Um, you know, imagine working so hard and then having to go to school, that's difficult to learn, you know? So the, the cycle of poverty continues and they're unable to stop it because they don't have many options when it comes to what they can do for work to earn money. Um, and I wanted to say in 2020 alone, an estimated 1.56 million children as young as five ended up on those farms. They were working in 2020, 1.56. 56 million children working on those farms and they get there in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's their parents' farm and the children are expected to work to help earn money for the house. 
um, and for the family. Um, sometimes if parents sell their children into slavery because they can't feed them and they need money to feed themselves and feed their other children. And this is like a very lucrative market. So unfortunately that is something that happens. Um, and then uh, other ways is, another way is the traffickers being deceptive, telling the parents one thing, like we have this great opportunity for your child to earn money for you guys. So um, let your child come here and we'll, they'll work doing something obviously not dangerous, something safe, something good. And it's a lie. And these children end up in these areas and ends up in situations like this. So, you know, this is clearly dangerous work for children. But I will move on to Summer. We'll talk more about the legal aspects of this. Thanks, Gigi. Um, as Gigi mentioned, I'm going to talk about the legal aspects and give you guys a little bit of an emotional break um, until we move back on to Julie. But I, I want to talk about it in terms of a legal framework because we're not talking about this in terms of policy change. This is already a law and now we're just looking towards law enforcement. Um, so the relevant law here is the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930. And this act prohibits the importation into the United States of goods produced with forced labor, which includes child labor. Um, this enforcement is the responsibility of the Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection. Um, when they do enforce these things, the mechanisms they have are criminal investigations, prosecutions, and withhold release orders, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but I guess a big question that this law raises is why didn't it work? If this happened in the 1930s, why are we still talking about it now? And Gigi, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so when the law was initially enacted, it had what was called the consumptive demand clause, um, which was an exception, a massive exception, that allowed for the importation of unethical goods if they were produced in such quantities in the United States as to not meet the consumptive demands of the United States. Essentially, if we couldn't make as much as we use, we could import it regardless of whether forced labor was involved. Well, in 2015, Congress repealed that exception through the Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act of 2015. And now we have zero exceptions to the importation of goods produced with forced labor into the United States. Um, so now let's look at what happens whenever the law is enforced. Thank you. Thanks. Um, as I mentioned before, Customs and Border Protection can issue withhold release orders, which um, what those do is stop the goods at the border and prevent them from ever entering the United States. The image that I have here um, shows what you find on Customs and Border Protection's website, which is a list broken down by country of all the withhold release orders that have been issued. Um, you see the date of issuance, the merchandise at issue, the manufacturers to whom the withhold release order applies, and the status of the withhold release order. As you can see from the withhold release orders for the manufacturers from Malaysia, the merchandise can be really broad or really specific. Um, and it can pretty much apply to anything, especially considering how forced labor is used in so many ways around the world. Here you can see palm oil, which um, has been relatively prominent in the media lately. And I know Melody is going to talk to you a little bit about that later. But I also wanted to point out another relatively prominent um, withhold release order that people might be aware of, which is the tobacco produced in Malawi. Um, that withhold release order applies to all tobacco products produced in Malawi, which was very significant um, because the withhold release order didn't name a specific manufacturer, as you see here. Um, instead, it was broad to the entire region and, and it exempted certain manufacturers in the status. So what I mean by that is that the status was listed as inactive for certain manufacturers only and active for the remaining manufacturers in Malawi. Um, since the initial withhold release order didn't specific, specify a manufacturer. And um, Judy, you can go next slide. So why is that important? Um, and the answer is because Customs and Border Protection doesn't generally target entire lines or industries. Uh, this is a major challenge to the enforcement law, especially when entire industries, such as the cocoa industry, are rampant with forced labor. But Customs and Border Protection and the Department of Homeland Security do have the ability to address these more widespread violations. And only days ago, they demonstrated that ability. So the Department of Homeland Security issued a withhold release order effective January 13th on all cotton and tomato products produced in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. 
The withhold release order not only includes cotton and tomato products originating in the region, but it also applies to cotton and tomatoes grown in the region and all products made in whole or in part with the cotton or tomatoes from the region, regardless of where the downstream product was produced. This means that importers have to be aware of their entire supply chain to ensure that their products don't exploit forced labor at any point and get held at the border. Um, it's debatably the most expansive withhold release order issue to date. Through the course of its investigation, the agency identified several forced labor indicators, including debt bondage, restriction of movement, isolation, intimidation and threats, withholding of wages, and abusive working and living conditions. Um, and I also wanted to point out that the Department of Homeland Security has issued four withhold release orders since the beginning of fiscal year 2021, as of when this presentation was created um, just a few days ago. And meanwhile, in 2020, we had less than 20 withhold release orders issued over the entire year. I want to say it was um, 14 or 16, if I remember correctly. And over half of those were on goods made in China, including several narrower withhold release orders on cotton from specific manufacturers in the Xinjiang region. Okay, if we do, we can go to the next. So what I'm trying to point out here is that um, Customs and Border Protection and Department of Homeland Security have shown their ability to make an impact. And they've stated that they're not going to tolerate the human rights violation that is modern slavery. They've also acknowledged the importance of their role in preventing the atrocity by preventing the importation of goods produced with forced labor. Because once it's on our shelves, Americans are typically unaware or engaging in willful ignorance regarding the harms that our purchases are causing. Um, I know that I saw a comment earlier that this, what Gigi was saying is heartbreaking and it's true, but it's also heartbreaking to find out that we are contributing um, to this, this industry. Um, although the Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection are moving in the right direction, it's just important that we continue to raise awareness about the various industries engaging in labor trafficking, especially those outside of China, um, which have not been widely acknowledged by Customs and Border Protection. Okay, so then this slide, I just wanted to point out the fact that not only do we have a legal obligation stemming from our own laws, but we also have an international obligation to oppose, um, to oppose and work to overcome labor trafficking. The obligation comes from ILO Convention Number 182, which is now known as the Convention on Worst Forms of Child Labor, and it calls for the prohibition and elimination of child labor, specifically the worst forms of child labor. The United States ratified this convention in 1999 under the Clinton administration. And importantly, it was the first universal ratification of any labor convention. Eight out of member countries ratifying the convention. Ultimately, this reflects a global commitment to end child labor. But as we know, child labor and other forms of labor trafficking are still thriving both domestically and internationally. So we have a lot of work to do. I'm gonna pass it over to Julie now to tell you more about what we at the Health Clinic have been doing over the past year to generate change. Okay, thanks, Summer. Um, so in our clinic at the law school, we learned about the horrors uh, that Gigi discussed, as well as the laws that Summer just reviewed. And with this knowledge, we sought out ways to bring about change. So the first thing that we did was get a letter to the Department of Homeland Security asking that the laws that Summer just uh, discussed be applied. And we outlined some key points as to why, beyond just following the laws of the United States, um, that this is important. So a few of those include, one, the failure of applying the law, two, the failure of self-regulation within the cocoa industry, um, the on the more international global scale, um, the violations of human rights laws um, and the industry abuses that went in place. So I'm gonna to touch on a few things I was gonna say that you saw in the video, but you'll see in the video um, as well, because um, along with this letter to the Department of Homeland Security, um, we went ahead and did that. And I, I just wanna note really quick in terms of the letter um, that went out to, um, a secretary that just recently resigned um, and an administration that is no longer in place. So um, we hope to update that letter, including um, some of the new uh, withhold release orders that some are just detailed um, to show how we are seeing some application of this law, but 
it's not consistently applied, and sometimes it's applied more for political reasons than the reasons that the law is in place for. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. So I want to talk a minute about this um, Harkin Engel protocol. So what this was, um, was an attempt at self-regulation between the government and the cocoa industry. So this issue of child labor, um, very dangerous child labor that occurs within the cocoa industry has been known for over 20 years. So this isn't a surprise thing within the industry. This isn't something that they haven't been aware of. It's something they've very well been aware of um, for the past 20 years. And within their self-regulation bubble, they set these deadlines uh, for when they're going to eliminate the child labor practices within the industry. Um, and you can see on this slide, all the deadlines that they've missed including the one this past year for 2020. So what's happened during that time that they were supposedly working to end child labor, it's increased dramatically, 21% increase um, since just 2008. Again, the slides we were looking at since this self-regulation attempt started was 2001 and this practice has been ongoing um, before that as well. So a 21% increase in child labor within this industry alone um, during that time period. And just to touch on a very, what you'll see on the next slide. So what we've seen within the cocoa industry is tremendous revenue, tremendous profits off of this known use of child labor. And their attempt at self-regulation is, despicable, <laughs> I'll say. Um, so this is a graphic that just shows one year of revenue for the cocoa industry versus 18 years of expenditures to end child labor practices um, within the Ghana and Ivory Coast region of Africa. So we can't show graphically what that actually looks like apples to apples um, in terms of 18 years of revenue and 18 years of expenditures or one year of revenue and one year of expenditures because it's so minute. Um, it's really disturbing to see how much this industry has knowingly profited off of child labor practices. And their continued excuse has been that it's just too difficult of a problem to solve or they just can't figure out how to do it. Um, and so I'll touch on um, that argument in the next slide. So what we have here, um, an example here, and I, I believe I saw it in the chat as well, um, Tony Chocoloni, and you'll see this in the video as well, um, is one company that's shown that um, not only can it be done, but it's really not that hard. Um, they're a small company, uh, and really all they do is they work more directly. They kind of take those middlemen out of the equation, and cocoa beans are sold by the ton, so they just pay more per ton, which works to provide a living wage for the plantation owners so that they don't have to use extremely cheap or uh, forced labor uh, from children. And so some of the things that we can do is use those, um, buy chocolate from those companies. And I will say Tony's chocolate is phenomenal. I won't buy any other chocolate. Uh, it's not kind of watered down or um, cocoa powder based chocolate. It's amazing. Um, but also look for the fair trade ethically sourced uh, chocolates that are available out there as well, because these um, plantation owners that grow cocoa work extremely hard and extremely hot and dangerous conditions to try to provide a living for their families. Um, and so if they are provided a living wage, then we won't have these issues of child labor practices. So the video is one thing that we did um, and we sent that out to um, those in the law community. We've sent those out to other law schools, um, presented out to social media, just working to get awareness out there to people like you um, so that you know what's going on and can do things like um, making an impact with your wallet and, and using those, uh, purchasing those products that are ethically sourced, um, that are fair trade and work to provide um, a living for those in that. And we've seen that be successful in, in other markets and fields before, like the organic food industry. Uh, we've seen that kind of blow up because people showed that demand for it. 
Um, so the video is one component. I'll go to the next. Uh, we've also worked on some media interviews. So here's a link to one that we did recently with NPR talking about, again, just the impact of chocolate. There's the link on here as well. So working to build awareness and accountability of what's going on and uh, why it's important and what we can do about it. And we also have a podcast that Summer headed up that we'll have um, coming out soon. We'll get more information out to you guys when we have that as well. And next. Okay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Melody. Thank you, Julie. Hi, everyone. So at this point in the presentation, you might be thinking um, about how you can help. Uh, we've discussed chocolate and chocolate is a big deal, but it's not the only industry with problems. The Department of Labor in 2020 um, produced a list of goods that were produced with child labor or forced labor. And there's a link to the full list on the PowerPoint if you'd like to look later. Uh, this list includes coffee, cotton, diamonds, palm oil, shrimp, uh, chocolate, bricks, um, garments, a lot of different uh, different goods that are produced with child or forced labor. Uh, I wanted to touch on one particular uh, child in the United States and one in that was a child worker in Indonesia. Um, Olivia Chaffin was a Girl Scout um, that she that realized she was still selling Girl Scout cookies that said they were using sustainable palm oil. Um, and then she looked a little deeper and realized that the sustainable palm oil was being mixed with unsustainable palm oil. Um, Ima is a 10 year old child worker in Indonesia. Um, she had to quit school to work up to 12 hours a day um, in the palm oil areas, the plantations. Um, she was working in flip flops with no gloves. She was being exposed to lots of pesticides um, and it just backbreaking labor. Some of the younger boys that work in the palm oil plantations have to uh, carry wheelbarrows that weigh more than they do all day long. Um, some of the families that are working in the palm oil indus industry uh, end up making less than $5 a day for the entire family, um, which is less than one box of Girl Scout cookies. According to the Associated Press, palm oil is contained in roughly half of the products on supermarket shelves. Um, it's also in cosmetic brands. Um, and it can be difficult to realize what is palm oil when you're reading ingredients because it's uh, under different labels. Sometimes it's palm oil, sometimes it's palm kernel oil, sometimes it's just kernel oil. Um, if you'd like to learn more about IMA um, or about the Girl Scout that has been raising awareness about palm oil, um, there's a link to the Associated Press News article as well. Uh, another thing that we can do now, there is a new administration in the White House as of yesterday. Um, we can, as individuals, ask our representatives to um, enforce the law try and make sure that Homeland Security knows that this is an issue that's important to a lot of people. And the more people that call the representatives, uh, the more likely that will raise awareness and have um, the enforcement uh, happen. Uh, you can also write to Homeland Security and ask that they enforce the law banning importation of products made with child labor or forced labor. Um, if you don't know your representative offhand, there was a link on the previous slide um, where you can look up that information really easily. Um, another thing we can do is raise awareness like we're doing today uh, and we can buy ethically. So, you know, use your dollar and support the um, industries that you think are being ethical. Uh, you can refuse to buy goods made with slave labor. Um, if you'd like to sign the petition, um, made by Olivia, the Girl Scout. I listed it up there, so you can sign the change petition. Uh, you can research your favorite products. Um, if you have a favorite makeup brand that you like to wear, uh, you can write to their customer service and ask if they're using palm oil and ask if that palm oil is sustainable. Uh, you can buy fair trade. We had a list earlier in the presentation uh, with the fair trade logos. So we'll look, with, look for those logos and uh, purchase those goods. 
um, you can raise your awareness and raise awareness to those around you. All of you are doing a great job just by being here today. Um, and you can reduce your own consumption and reuse when possible. If you'd like to learn more about labor trafficking and the exploitation of child workers, uh, there's some additional resources here. I believe that one, that slavery footprint was already put in the chat. That's a great website. Uh, this also lists fair trade certified. It has the list of goods that were produced with child labor. Um, it has a link to a documentary called uh, The Dark Side of Chocolate, which um, really shows a lot of what happens in the cocoa uh, on the cocoa plantations. Finally, if there seems like there's a lot, uh, there's a long list of goods that are produced with child labor or forced labor, um, there's always a way to start small. So this year we're just asking uh, with Valentine's Day coming up, maybe make this year the, the year that you switch to um, fair trade chocolate so that you and your sweetheart this year can enjoy chocolate without human and child suffering. Uh, finally, if you have any questions after this presentation is over, our emails are all listed here and you can email any of us and we'd, be, we'd love to help. Uh, we have the help podcast coming out soon um, and I believe we were going to, oh yes, um, I was going to ask Eddie, I think, if I could show the video from earlier, if we had time. I don't think that I have the share screen capabilities. Yes, I, I can. Uh, it, we, we could try and share it again um, from Gigi's computer, or if if it's um, still freezing, I can attempt to share my screen and share it from my my end. I could okay, try. Let me see if if I could always forward you this email I have with the MP4 video. Is that okay, Eddie? Oh, um, yeah, sure. We could try that. Okay. And as you're doing that, why don't we take a couple questions just as you're trying to set up. Um, we got a first question for you all. Know that these this is a time where we can start to see if we can do questions for both Barbara and for all of you. By the way, thank you. What a lot of work. What a great project. Um, just terrific information for everybody. Um, so there's a question, um, do any cocoa producing countries do a good job of regulating trafficking in their cocoa growing and harvesting? That would be within countries. Do you know if anybody's doing a good job? So I can um, kind of try to answer this in a little bit of a roundabout way, maybe not as specifically, um, but I would say the short answer is probably no. Um, and that's for a few reasons. One, this is profitable for the country too, considering it's an export um, for the country. But two, it's not always as obvious, especially in countries where it's more agricultural or where the country isn't as developed or regulated as the United States. Um, so for example, I went to India as Professor Nino mentioned. And while I was there, I worked with 52 little boys who were rescued from a factory. Um, and this, the rescue is not to do with the government at all, essentially. Um, we were working with a nonprofit who actually did go in and rescue the boys and then house the boys and tell them they could figure out um, the next move. But the thing that was kind of heartbreaking for me was that the factory produced jeans that were purchased by companies that I, I purchased from in the United States. Um, and it's not something I would have obviously known until I had this experience, but essentially it was a very underground operation um, where the jeans were coming from. And so it wasn't like they were going in and inspecting the factory. Um, and then once it's exporting, it's just, um, I would say probably easier to turn a blind eye because it is profitable in um, America and other more developed countries, the purchasing countries are paying top dollar um, comparatively for these products. Um, so while so, I would say it's more likely that there are small companies doing good rather than a country as a whole being a regulator in this, in this way. Um, the United States and other countries that are the importers are the ones that are at this point trying to do the most work when it comes to regulation. Thanks, and I'm going to put into the chat the list to the 2020 Human Trafficking and Persons Report from the State Department where it does go through 
um, various country activities, although most of the time they're focused on um, criminal prosecutions, laws that are passed, et cetera. So, um, so thank you for that, Summer. Um, and I'll, I'll put this link in right now. Are we ready, Eddie? Ready, Eddie? <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I'll go ahead and try and share the video from, from my end here. Very good, thanks. Should we start from the beginning or, or try and, might as well start from the beginning, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. Can you all hear the audio? OK, let me try again. Now, I wonder, um, and just if anyone, anybody has any um, questions, please put them in the chat. Um, because if we can answer questions live, we can do that, as we can definitely have the video in the link. Um, Anybody have any questions? Oh, here's one. Could Lord, large corporations be sued and held accountable for their supply chains? And um, that's a really good one, Barbara. Um, before you start, Eddie, let's take this question. So um, could these large corporations be sued and held accountable for supply chains? And I'll look to, um, to Barbara. What do you think? So for... For civil suits and criminal prosecutions, as opposed to regulation violations, um, the the yeah the answer is yes. However, um, the types of claims that are available are limited. I don't know if, if folks are aware that there was a, a Hershey case that went up to the Supreme Court um, just recently in this past year. They limited some of the tort. Uh, types of, of actions that can be filed um, for for basically conduct that occurs over, overseas. So, so the the simple answer um, I think is yes. However, um, there has to be some knowledge. There has to be some um, you know instances where you're really able to show that that they're very much ignoring um, the problem and you have to find a statute um, that that fits well for civil I think it's difficult um, and for criminal the standard is high so the reality is that it's challenging um, it, it is not an easy thing to do there has been civil suit against um, you know some companies that, of chocolate so far, they've not been very successful to be frank, sadly. So it goes back to that one uh, picture you had with the circles, right? That that taking action against these com uh, companies is just exactly what the law students and uh, Paolo are talking about to us now, which is we have the power with our dollars to make choices and force enforcements as well. Um, okay, yes, Eddie. All right, Eddie, you want to try again? Hi, I'm Julie, and we are students at Florida State University College of Law in the Human Trafficking Exploitation Law Project, working to end child labor practices in the cocoa industry. Children are our future, and it's important that each and every child is protected. During Halloween, we all love seeing the smiling faces and hearing the happy chatter of children as they eagerly watch candy bars plop into their bags. But before buying and handing out candy this Halloween season, please keep in mind where that cocoa for the chocolate bar originated from. Children, primarily between the ages of 5 and 11, are being forced to wield dangerous tools like this one. Accidents are frequent and limbs, sometimes even lives, are lost to child labor. Imagine a seven-year-old being forced to wield this machete to harvest the cocoa that makes treats just for us. Sadly, he and his counterparts will likely never taste the end product. Remember, safety, happiness, and the overall well-being of children everywhere should be prioritized. And as of now, not many companies are committed to eradicating this form of child labor. It's time for us to speak up with our wallets. 
The cocoa industry has known for nearly 20 years that children are used to harvest cocoa beans, working in dangerous conditions, and they promised the U.S. government that they would work to end this practice. However, instead, they've missed every deadline and have made over $1 trillion in revenue off of these practices. During that time, they've spent less than one-tenth of 1% one to actually end child labor practices. Now, we know that it can be done. There are great companies out there, like Tony's Chocoloni, who simply pay a few hundred dollars more per ton of cocoa beans to provide a living wage to plantation owners so that the child labor practices can end. We are asking the cocoa industry to do the same. According to the Office of the United States Trade Representative, the United States imported $169 million worth of cocoa from Ghana and a whopping $734 million from the Ivory Coast in 2018. Two million children whose labor produced this cocoa have been trapped and forced into this horrific life, making only about 85 cents a day. To put this into perspective, this is what 85 cents looks like. These children deserve better. I'm passionate about advocating for children because their voices are often stifled. If you believe in taking a stand against human labor trafficking, then please join our cause. Together, we can do our part to help protect these children from human traffickers. Here at the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Law Project, we are asking the Department of Homeland Security to work with U.S. Customs and Border Patrol to uphold U.S. laws prohibiting the importation of goods produced by any form of child labor. The U.S. is a major consumer of chocolate with $900 million worth imported in 2018 from countries known to use child labor. Limiting this intake, even for a short period of time, could have sweeping changes. Please join us in support as we ask our government to uphold the laws forbidding the importation of cocoa harvested by child labor. Here are some things you can do individually. One is to write to companies and let them know how important this issue is to you. You can also inform those around you. Don't worry, you can still eat chocolate. Just purchase chocolate with a fair trade label on it like this one. Abby here can't eat chocolate, but this Halloween, she wants you to only eat chocolate with a fair trade label on it. So wonderful. Thank you all. Just bravo for your hard work on that. Um, also, I want to give a real quick shout out Daniela Donoso, who is with um, Legal Services of North Florida, formerly with the um, uh, at the law school, she just graduated um, recently, has been instrumental in putting this program together. So Daniela, yay, thank you for everything you've done. Um, we had another comment from, um, from um, Elia who says that um, there are cosmetic companies, Beauty Counter and Lush that commit to transparency and an ethical supply chain. Zinc is a common ingredient in cosmetics that is sourced from child slavery in India. So um, thank you, Alia, for that comment. Um, I also put up into the chat information about Imagining Freedom. It's our annual event with Stack where we do highlight local farmers and like Red Hill Small Farm Alliance, which is the first uh, organization to my knowledge in our area that has committed across the board for all of its farmers that all of their labor practices are slavery and trafficking free. And we'll be doing some work with them as well, doing education and awareness. So, you know, again, it's that ripple effect of training and, and awareness building that's so, so important. Um, we want to also share with you and I'll ask Eddie and don't forget, uh, chat your questions in here. Um, but as we're getting more questions in, I was wondering if Eddie, you could share the um, CLE certificate for all of the lawyers on, um, on this today. So you can get your 2.5 uh, general CLE credit hours, um, all the information on that, the reference number and the title. Um, so you can get those, those CLE credit hours in. That would be great, Eddie, thank you. Um, 
Can I ask you, Barbara, um, and the students, do you have any any observations about each of your presentations and anything you want to ask one another while we wait for questions to come in? Well, I definitely want to say that it's really impressive, the work that you guys are doing. I love, love, love the video. Uh, and um, I think it's a great message to send out. And anything we can do to spread the word is amazing because so many people are, are really completely un unaware. Um, I think as far, uh, you know, I was thinking about the regulations and the enforcement of it um, and, it, you know, how Customs and Border Patrol really has to, to do all of that. And um, it, it is, ha having seen all of the things that they are responsible for, I keep going back to this kind of same maybe pessimism about, you know, how, that it, it, sometimes it's a lack of motivation, absolutely, um, and mandate from the top down about priorities for enforcement is really key. So I love this idea and suggestion of working of, of reaching out to you know uh, your representative, because I just think that they see there's so many other things that they have to regulate that they see this as not as important. Um, as, as much as people can say, oh, you know, this is horrible, this is what's happening. I, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, they have so many things they have to inspect and do that the only way that they're really able to focus their uh, time and resources, um, whether, and I'm not saying it's right, by the way, uh, but, you know, is if they're getting pressure to say this, this is a priority, you know. So, so getting back to kind of what Robin said you, the, the consumer piece, the pressure on the businesses from a marketing standpoint too, right? And from, you know, when there's a movement and people, this is the end thing. Uh, and, and, and obviously buying, you know, slave free items should be an end thing. But if they get pressure uh, that way, that also tends to impact things. Um, and so, you know, I just, I just highlight for you that I, I have found uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I used to hear people say, you know, certain law enforcement folks who'd been around a long time say, oh, that, you know, can't do that. Uh, can't do that. It's impossible. There's no, you know, it's it's a no can do. Uh, and, and I would always say, I don't want to hear that. Uh, that's not the start of the conversation. But that's kind of the mindset because of all of the things that they're doing. And so I think uh, highlighting uh, holistically, again, from the top, and also the consumer piece and the pressure in that way is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And students, is that, is that you, Paulo? Yeah, I just wanted to just answer that question too. One of the things I, I really I really enjoyed in, in uh, uh, Barbara Martinez's presentation, but my takeaway, you know, I always have a takeaway. My takeaway, which I say, because I knew it, but I sort of don't, didn't focus as much as I should focus on, and so it was really helpful for me in my teaching is when uh, Ms. Martinez said, uh, reckless disregard standard, the reckless disregard standard. A lot of times I don't focus on that as much as I need to. And that was very good. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that's very important for our corporate community and for our students and future lawyers to understand that the reckless disregard standard. I, I just wanted to, to share that with you. Thank you. I'll, I'll add one point as well. Um, you know, uh, we talked about the year of the uh, the international year to end child labor practices, and in Europe, they've recently passed laws regarding um, using child labor uh, in the cocoa industry. And our U.S. corporations were in support of that in Europe. They fought against that in the United States, which makes the United States a safe harbor for child labor practices, dangerous child labor practices. And that's something that should outrage all of us. Um, they have it on record in Europe that they support that, but in the US they fight against it. Um, and so I think that's something, again, it is something they know about. <laughs> they, they intentionally um, go through this process. They know there are avenues to change it. Um, it would just hurt their profits too much to care to do it. And that's something that we should make noise about um, and we should let them hear about and make other choices uh, financially um, 
in these areas. It, it, again, especially talk about where it's been known for so long and it's just a blind eye has been tur turned to it because economically it's so profitable and that shouldn't be acceptable for us. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I wanted to let you all know, it looked like the CLE posting was a little bit fuzzy. So I put the reference number for the 2.5 hours of CLE in the chat. Um, it is 210019N, that is 210019N, that's N as in Nancy, for the 2.5 hours of general CLE credit. And um, I think that we're at uh, just about the closing bell here. So um, I put also um, my contact information. Would love, love, love to continue this conversation. I know we will with all of you at FSU College of Law for sure. Um, but also with everyone who's on this phone call, I mean, this Zoom now, because it really is in our hands to make a huge difference. Um, in addition, I'd like to um, close up again by thanking all of, uh, all of you speakers, all of you who attended FSU College of Law for sponsoring and doing all the tech support, um, our Dean, all of our um, other sponsors the, and the Big Ben Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Um, want to definitely let you know too that um, Stack does this work to bring these programs to everyone for free. If you ever have uh, we had someone the other day donate part of a um, the stimulus check to our organization for which we were immensely grateful. So um, any donations that you would like to send our way, we would greatly appreciate. This is a tough time for nonprofits and, and we're all trying to keep the work accessible to everybody. So, so please keep Stack in mind. Know that we're always available. Um, I'm gonna you know, go to surviveandthriveadvocacy.org. We've got a week full of events next week as well. Mm -hmm. So we'd love for you to be part of those. And I will um, close and just um, say, is there anything tech, anybody got any other questions? Thank you, I got, um, okay, we got a lot of good chats saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all, we love you very much and we'll see you next year, if not sooner. Take care. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.